Hato, everybody. Welcome back. And if it's not welcome back, if this is your first time watching one of my videos, then Hato, welcome. My name is Talon Silverhorn. I am a historical interpreter, and my goal is to promote cultural exchange and awareness pretty much wherever possible. And that includes social media platforms like YouTube or Facebook or Instagram or any place that I can encourage Native youth to get out there, share their experiences, and talk about themselves. If you're a Native person watching this, if you're a Native youth watching this, make yourself visible. Go out and make videos. Go out and take pictures. Go out and create content that can be used to spread our influence as Native folks out throughout this modern world. Today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about historic clothing since people are very interested in some of this material culture. It's an excellent tool for us as Native people to be able to use to bridge that gap to get into the basics about our culture and about the things that we want to educate people about. And this time of year when it starts to get cold, when it starts to frost over, when the snow starts to come, we start to tell stories, we start to hunker down for the winter traditionally. This is the time that we would start to put on a little bit different clothing from what you might see in the day to day. So things like match coats, things like mantles or blanket coats, capotes, leather jackets, all those kinds of things like that that you might see in the wintertime uh, that are helpful for going out in that snow, for going out hunting, for kind of just traveling outside your community or your home when it's cold outside. So I just wanted to show you some of the basic things that you might be wearing if you lived in the 18th century or as part of one of these tribes in the eastern woodlands, what you might be taking with you, what you might be wearing uh, if you were going out. Now this doesn't include everything. And I can tell you right off the bat some of the things that are missing from this, since I just threw this together kind of last minute. Some of the things that are missing from this are an extra pair of moccasins, moccasin liners. So uh, some wool stitched up just like a moccasin, but only goes on the inside. Um, that's very useful for, for the winter time. Maybe snowshoes if it's snowing, right? Some other things that I'm missing are a fire kit, right? So I would have, I would want to carry two types of fire kit with me uh, because they don't take up that much space. One would be a burning glass, which is readily available in the 18th century as a trade item. Uh, it's pretty delicate. A much more robust item is, of course, flint and steel. Much more uh, sort of rugged. You can't really uh, damage that too easily, but it has a little bit harder time working in wetter conditions. You can use that burning glass to actually dry out some of your tinder uh, before you light, but it relies on a sunny day. Whereas flint and steel, you can use pretty much whenever. I've got myself a good good knife for cutting up uh, meat and tinder and all the things that I might be doing. I've got my mantle, which is made out of beaver skins. I've got a blanket coat and I'm actually sitting on a white military blanket like what this coat is made from. So let's back up this camera and I'll show you kind of what I'm wearing. Okay, so first things first, let's talk about what I'm actually wearing sort of as a base. I've got a uh, check uh, cotton shirt on. I have, of course, my bag. So check cotton shirt, bag. I've got my finger woven strap. We've got leggings, garters, breech clout, all that good stuff. Now, yes, in the 18th century, uh, pull that camera down there. In the 18th century, talk about wintertime clothing, leggings, breech clout, moccasins. These things are still standard for the wintertime. There's not a whole lot more you could add to this besides maybe uh, if you were a lady, like a wrap skirt. So wool leggings, these are some uh, uh, heddle woven garters that I've got on at the moment, and then a breech clout. Moccasins made out of a whole lot of that deer skin. So this is the standard. You could put moccasin liners in these moccasins if you wanted to make them a little bit warmer. Uh, but I'm just wearing socks, so it works well enough for me. First article of clothing that I want to show you and want to talk about is the blanket, or uh, you could use this kind of like as a match coat, right? So if you're going out hunting, you're going out traveling, if you know you're going to be staying the night, this is an extremely important piece because this is what you're going to use whoops, to kind of keep yourself warm with. Now this is a white military blanket, uh, but red and green and blue, a black, purple stroud can be used uh, as match coats, right? So if I've got my bow and my arrows uh, going out hunting, this is a great, great addition to your kit and going out there, right? You should never travel anywhere without a match coat or a blanket. These become popular uh, pretty much right at European trade. So the minute that blankets and guns and powder and shot and all these other things become available, they are adopted through that trade system. 
in exchange for furs and for pelts, which we are not using hardly anymore for those traditional like mantles, which I'm about to show you. So this is a mantle. This is a beaver skin mantle that I made. Um, it is seven beaver skins stitched together. So this is nice and thick and warm, but it's also fairly heavy. Uh, for kind of pound for pound, I'd say that that uh, wool blanket does a little bit better job of staying warm, but it does breathe a little bit more. These things are excellent for blocking out uh, the wind. So if I want to block out the wind, this is pretty much an impenetrable layer. And it's a great addition over top of something like a match coat or a capote. So an under layer match coat plus uh, this mantle, Hard to beat, hard to beat. Okay, and the last little piece of winter clothing that I'm gonna show y'all is a blanket coat or capote, right? So these, you might have seen the uh, kind of striped colorful ones like the Hudson Bay style. Those are not accurate for the 18th century in the Eastern Woodlands. So these white military uh, blanket coats are much more of the style of what people were wearing. There's one account of a Shawnee man, I think in a sky blue, uh, coat, but those really colorful striped ones, those are more common uh, farther west and not in the 18th century eastern woodlands. So if you are putting together a kit or if you're looking at uh, doing this now, they just tie in the front like this, but they're made from that same nice wool that the blankets are made out of. So nice and thick and warm, good for traveling. They also have a hood, uh, which is great for going through the snow. There we go. I was wondering if you could hear me going for the snow, uh, you know, it's wetter weather outside. Now here's the other thing. Here's kind of the, the, the coup de grace to all of this. Uh, if you're traveling, if you don't have that blanket bound up in a tump line on your back, you could still take this blanket and wear it as a match coat. You could still double up on this layer. Uh, and you can see here it's laying over me like a mantle. Or <laughs> let's go ahead and triple up and let's see how this does. I'm already toasty. I'll tell you that right now. So we triple up here. Uh, we tripled up and put this hood up on this uh, capote. Man, I tell you what, it'd be hard, hard to beat. So this right here is the perfect. If I was going to be going, uh, say, making my bed, if I didn't use this blanket to, to lay down uh, to make my bed, I would be super warm and this would be perfect for going out hunting in the winter time. So there we go. Nice warm clothing. Everything's made out of wool. Uh, the What little furs that we're using in the 18th century to make clothing. There is an account of beaver skin uh, robes being gifted to the delegates at Williamsburg in the 1700s. So we do know that they're still kind of around, but they're not as prevalent as the mantles of old, right? So those old raccoon and deer hide mantles and beaver and bear and elk and all the other robes and things that we used to have, those have kind of gone out of fashion and they're much more suitable for trade in exchange for all these other goods. Here are some historical images of winter wear. So you can see a woman here in a wrap skirt with a blanket very, very similar to mine. And this painting of a camp, a hunting camp with blanket coats.